It's almost two years since more than 700,000 Rohingya fled a military crackdown in Myanmar. Since then, they've been crammed into squalid camps in Bangladesh. But Myanmar's government is under pressure to take them back. So what are they offering? And is it enough? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the programme. I'm Martine Dennis. The Rohingya people have been called the most persecuted minority in the world. Myanmar doesn't even recognise this mainly Muslim ethnic group as citizens. And in 2017, it began a crackdown after attacks on its army by some Rohingya. Now, the UN labelled what followed a textbook example of ethnic cleansing. Soldiers were accused of killing and raping Rohingya and destroying their villages. More than 700,000 of them managed to escape to Bangladesh, saying they wouldn't return until Myanmar guarantees their safety and gives them citizenship. A government delegation has spent two days trying to convince them to leave the world's largest refugee camp and to go home to Rakhine State, from where they fled two years ago. At least those who live in Myanmar for three generations they are entitled to apply for the what we call naturalized citizenship. Once parents apply for the natural citizenship, uh, their sons and daughters, their offspring are entitled to apply for the citizenship. So we are trying to explain to them what are the, the possibility of citizenship. So of course, according to the law, they may not be entitled for the full-fledged citizenship, but they are entitled to naturalized citizenship and eventually their sons and daughters and grandsons and daughters will be entitled for the citizenship, full-fledged citizenship. And the term Rohingya for them? Definitely we will not be considered it as an uh, issue for us because we will be granting them as a nationality of Myanmar and then eventually uh, we will be providing them with the EIT cards. All right, let's uh, introduce our guests now. In Dhaka, in Bangladesh, we have Rohingya researcher and writer Aman Ula. In Naipidor, in Myanmar, via Skype, we have Phil Robertson, Deputy Director of the Asia Division at Human Rights Watch. And from London, we have Ronan Lee, a visiting scholar at the International State Crime Initiative at Queen Mary University of London. Welcome to you all. But uh, I want to ask you first, uh, Aman, uh, from what you heard from that senior government official who's currently in Cox's Bazaar trying to persuade uh, the Rohingya refugees to go back home, from what you heard, uh, did that fill you with confidence? Does that make you think that you would like to go back home to Myanmar? Firstly, I want to say that they are not coming to convince this refugee. They are coming to enforce this refugee, number one. Number two, I think that gentleman did not read the 1982 citizenship law. In 1982 citizenship law, three generations will automatically become the citizen, full citizen of the country. If someone is a, a gas citizen or naturalized citizen, their offspring, third generation will be automatic full fledged citizenship. But he's, now he's saying that Three generations will be only naturalized citizens. That is different with the 1982 citizen law and his. Right. Uh, okay. Now his speech. Okay, Aman. So, and, uh, so uh, sorry. Coming to coming uh, to you, uh, Phil. Uh, uh, yeah. Sorry, Aman. I'll come back to you in just a, just a moment. Let's now go to to Phil Robertson, who's in Naypyidaw, the uh, uh, the capital of Myanmar. From what you've heard, uh, is there anything new? in what the government is offering to the Rohingya. Uh, Aman clearly thinks that there's not much involved at all that could persuade people back. Uh, they have a very hard road to hold to get these people to go back because there's no trust whatsoever uh, uh, of these promises that the Myanmar government officials are making uh, to those people in the camps. Uh, the reality is that uh, people want to return and have citizenship guaranteed. Uh, they have heard these promises. They've heard uh, that they can go through these procedures 
1982 citizenship law is something that has been on the books uh, and basically been discriminatory and, and hurtful to the Rohingya. And uh, they are not trustful of it. And right. they're not trustful of what the government is promising here. So I think that uh, the government of Myanmar has to do a lot better uh, if they're right. going to persuade people to go back. And Ronan, so what the government seems to be uh, offering, the, the, the nub of it, seems to be uh, some sort of pathway uh, to citizenship. Uh, the possibilities of citizenship is what they're calling it. Are the Rohingya, for the most part, right not to trust uh, the Myanmar government? They're 100% right not to trust the Myanmar government. Uh, Myanmar's government has, on a number of occasions over the last 50 years, uh, violently forced hundreds of thousands of Rohingya out of the country. And then, when there's international pressure for them to be returned, they've allowed a fraction to return, usually with diminished rights. So the situation in northern Rakhine state that we can see today uh, hasn't improved over the last two years. You could argue, I, I think, quite strongly that it's, that it's gotten worse. Uh, but the, the, whether or not there is goodwill on the part of the Myanmar authorities, I think, is demonstrated by the, the actions in and around Sitwe, where there are 100, 120,000 Rohingya living in camps that they were forced into in 2012. They're still there. I mean, these are concentration camps. There's right. no violence in that area. This is an area that Myanmar would describe as peaceful yet they've herded Rohingya into camps. Right. I, I think the Rohingya are right. Do not trust them. OK. And um, Aman, I mean, uh, Ronan has already indicated that uh, the persecution of the Rohingya goes way beyond 2017, doesn't it, which is the, the period of time that we're looking at now. Uh, you had to flee Myanmar many years before, 1985. Tell us about the circumstances that led you to leave your country. Yes. I, I leave from Burma in 1985 because of I was fear of arrest by the government authority. Before then, I was a t school teacher there for about 15 years. I served as a, a school teacher in a state schools. So in 19, before, in 19, from 1984, they are tracking me to arrest. So I have to to compel to, to flee from my country in 1985, uh, March. And, and ever since then, you've, you've been in Bangladesh, have you? Uh, presumably still stateless, presumably without any kind of travel documents, identity documents, am I right? Yeah, since then I was uh, not, I have no legal status. And, uh, and, what, and what sort of problems does that present for a person, to have no legal status? What does it mean for your life on a daily basis? I can stay here understanding on the understanding basis, but if anyone challenges me, I cannot do anything. I may, I may be arrested. Uh, what, what do you mean if, 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 if somebody challenges you? Do you mean if there's an altercation or a dispute, you're not protected by law, maybe? And, uh, yeah. At that, that time, I have no protection. Right. Now I can stay here, I can work here. Ah, I can, even I can meet some of the authority of this country. But if someone make anything against me, at that time, I have no protection. And uh, Phil... If a police arrest me, I have no protection. Right, OK. Phil, you're currently in Naipudor. I mean, the, the Myanmar government has been... Um, has been noted for its lack of cooperation, for its lack of, of uh, enthusiasm to engage with the outside world. Presumably, uh, Human Rights Watch now being in the capital uh, is quite a rare thing. What do you hope to achieve and what are, you, what are you picking up about the mood music whilst you're there? Well, you know, we hope that the government will ultimately recognise that it has to do right by the Rohingya. It has to uh, ultimately ensure uh, accountability for what has happened to the Rohingya in addition to allowing them to come back to have security guarantees, to have citizenship, to have freedom of movement, all the things that the Kofi Annan uh, Commission called for uh, in Rakhine State. Uh, and uh, we hope that this will be uh, something that the international community will see through as well, that they will continue to pressure uh, Myanmar until those goals are achieved. Because I think ultimately, 
the reason that we're actually having this delegation going to Cox's Bazaar is because the pressure has been unrelenting on the Myanmar government, that they have to bring these people back, and they have to bring them back in a way that is dignified, voluntary, and safe for them. And, and no one has talked about the security guarantees either. I mean, this is a big issue for the Rohingya as well. I mean, they don't want to return to an area where the security is provided by the same army and police uh, that were involved in uh, the violations against them, the crimes against humanity that occurred in 2017. Right. And uh, Ronan, so, so Phil's of the opinion that uh, uh, international condemnation is building up a certain head of pressure, and that's led to this delegation going to Cox's Bazaar. But it apparently hasn't yielded in anything uh, substantial in terms of the, uh, the substance of the offer or the substance of, 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 of what they're putting on the table for these uh, refugees, many of whom seem already to be saying, no way, we're not going back. Well, the substance of the offers... Uh, exactly the same as they were offered before they left, which is very little. Uh, it's the ability to participate in a discriminatory uh, citizenship process and to live in a part of the country where there is, quite frankly, an apartheid regime designed to discriminate against them. What Myanmar is changing at the moment, I think, because of the international pressure, is its international messaging. And I, I, would, I would consider the decision to visit Rohingya in the camps in Bangladesh, not as part of an attempt to convince Rohingya to return, but as part of a messaging to the international community. Uh, it's, it's an attempt by Myanmar's authorities to demonstrate that it, it's doing something uh, to uh, encourage Rohingya to return. And what this says is that the international community now needs to increase the pressure on Myanmar. We've seen very little in terms of holding perpetrators to account for uh, their actions, particularly during 2017. I mean, there, there, was, uh, there were crimes against humanity committed in, uh, against the Rohingya at that time, and no perpetrators have been held to account for that. There have yeah. been some travel bans, yep. so, so uh, generals won't be able to visit the United States, for instance, and, and Facebook means that they're not able to be on Facebook, so they can't post holiday pictures, as, as, as people uh, sort of often describe uh, what the penalty is for them. But, but nothing in terms of seriously holding perpetrators to account. Right. And that's what now needs to happen. There needs to be support, I think, for the International Criminal Court. OK, good thought to go back to Phil with. So, Phil, when we're talking about the international community um, uh, stepping up the pressure upon the government of, of Myanmar, who are we specifically talking about? Because, obviously, that's a, that's a huge uh, uh, world community, isn't it? Um, I think we're specifically talking about its neighbours, for instance, ASEAN, due to be meeting in Bangkok in the next uh, week or so. Uh, China, of course, the biggest, uh, the biggest defender, if you like, of, of the Myanmar government's action. Is this where uh, the pressure really needs to come from in order to affect some change, Phil? Well, I think obviously ASEAN is a critical part of this, but they are hopeless when it comes to applying a pressure to any sort of member state. Uh, all they've done so far is uh, done a bit of a survey of the uh, repatriation regimen and what would possibly happen if people came back. Uh, you know, they put out a report that leaked last month that, frankly, was uh, very inadequate. It didn't address any of the issues about why the Rohingya fled to Bangladesh in the first place. It just glossed over that and immediately went to the operational aspects of it. That, and that's not enough. But I think what we need to do is we need to have the United States and uh, the EU uh, and also the UK to press much harder uh, on sanctions against the top generals. I think the U.S. Treasury has to follow through on that travel ban by the U.S. State Department, you know, and really go after uh, the the generals and their assets. I think also we have to be looking at the uh, the two major corporations that operate under military control in Myanmar. The, Union of Myanmar Economic Holdings and the Myanmar Economic Corporation. These are uh, huge conglomerates with a great deal of uh, engagement in the international community, and there are pressure points that the international community needs now to push on in order to uh, get some accountability here, to sort of get some political commitment from the government of Myanmar that they will, in fact, uh, hold uh, top military people accountable. 
Right. Um, Aman, coming back to you and, and, and your life uh, as a stateless person in Bangladesh is exceedingly precarious. Uh, we can get that from, from, from what you've told us already. Are you not in the least bit tempted? Uh, I, I'll go back to, again, what you, Mient Thu, uh, was saying in Cox's Bazaar. He was saying uh, pretty soon um, that there will be EID cards where there will no longer be the issue of race or the issue of citizenship. It will only be like social security cards in the United States with names and some digits. Um, do you think that that is something that you and the people you know would be interested in exploring and perhaps going home and, and getting an EID card? No, it is uh, not legal, this EID card is. ID cards, they are always uh, lying to the people and to the wall. When in 1991, the UNSCR asked the Bangladesh government to give an identity card, they give a yellow card. Here they say that it is the first step to the citizenship. Now when they are going to the NBC, now they are saying that it is the first step toward the applying citizenship. Uh, now in Burma, there was no one citizen real. All are holding the national scrutinized, scrutinized card, not citizenship card, even Aung San Suu Kyi, even me, me online. Right. In the 1982 Citizenship Act, there is no scrutinized card. There are national ID card. Ah, no okay. one gets still right. national ID That's card. That's an important so distinction. So they are always playing with uh, the color of card and... Right. Yeah. Aman, this is an, Aman, we all are already, we get our citizens. Yeah. Right. Tell yeah. us, Aman, what yeah. life in Myanmar is like when you have a yellow card or a, an ID card, but you don't have citizenship. What does that mean for the life of a person in Myanmar who is Rohingya? He has nothing to do. He has no right to move and the right to family value, right to children, right to education, right to health care. Ah, he is no one there. Only he has to give the taxes, normal taxes and the extraordinary taxes to the government. Whenever they, 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 they ask, we people have to give them. If you study the tax data of the country, we people are the most uh, tax payable people in the, in Burma. Right. Um, coming coming to you, Phil. Um, what is the situation now in Rakhine State? There were recently some satellite pictures released by a, uh, an Australian group, which apparently showed uh, the, the 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 remnants of villages that had been razed completely to the ground. I mean, what do the authorities present? as the alternative accommodation for these people, should they uh, decide to take up the offer and, and go back home? Well, what we're seeing is, uh, in some cases, villages that people abandoned because of the uh, atrocities uh, who fled into, they fled into uh, Bangladesh and their, their standing villages are now being destroyed. Uh, we've seen other instances where partially destroyed uh, villages are completely destroyed. And, just flattened. Uh, the question is, what is being offered to, to these people who would go back? And they're talking about going back to the same area or they're talking about somewhere nearby. But again, these are just promises uh, that have not been uh, fully explained. Um, you know, people want to go back to their areas. But the problem is, even if they go back, are they going to be allowed freedom of movement? Are they going to be allowed access to basic essential services like access to health, access to education? Will they be able to move about and uh, pursue livelihoods? I mean, the freedom of movement issue uh, and the security issue is the core of the major problem here, that if they're able to return, will they be able to survive or will they return to the uh, de facto apartheid situation that we see uh, in the IDP camps in the central part of the state, where, uh, you know, Ronan said very clearly, you know, they could have done something to improve that situation. They have not done so. Uh, and that really raises some questions about the political commitment of the authorities uh, to allow true freedom of movement and real rights for the Rohingya people. Right. And, and, and Ronan, I suppose it's, it's useful to remind ourselves that Myanmar is a, 
uh, a, a country, a medium-sized uh, country, with 135 official ethnic groups. That's a hell of a lot, isn't it? In terms of Rakhine State, we're concentrating on the plight of the Rohingya people, but there are other ethnic groups as well who feel themselves to be marginalised and uh, quite often brutalised as well by the Myanmar authorities. Well, they are. Uh, the United Nations Human Rights Council investigation team uh, highlighted crimes against humanity uh, committed by Myanmar's military against groups in Kachin State, uh, Shan State and Rakhine State. So, uh, so a major international report highlighting uh, serious crimes uh, by Myanmar's uh, military, uh, not just against the Rohingya but against other groups. And the, the, the key point here is that Myanmar's military is constitutionally above the law. Uh, there is no one in the government uh, who can hold them to account. So it's really now up to uh, the international community to do that. Now, you could argue that Aung San Suu Kyi, as the civilian uh, leader of the country, uh, has some, I think, moral authority uh, to hold the military to account. But she's demonstrated that she's not interested in doing that. Right. She has absolutely no interest in calling out the military. So it's really left up to the international community. Right. And as Phil, as Phil suggested, the, a, a key way to do that is to take away their sources of income. Um, all right. Phil, in Naypyidaw, uh, in Rakhine State, uh, there seems to be uh, several axes of conflict. It's not just the military, is it, um, uh, attacking the Rohingya. There are also monks, there are also ordinary civilians who are, who are nationalists of one order or another. So it seems as though uh, there are many different layers of violence that the, the Rohingya, in, particularly in Rakhine, in the north-west of the state, uh, could face. So security guarantees are essential, aren't they, for these people, if, if indeed they're going to go back home? That's absolutely true. And the reality is that people are also going to face discriminatory uh, restrictions from the state authorities and from the local authorities. This is why I think if you talk to the Rohingya in Cox's Bazaar, they're talking about international security guarantees. They want international people being access, allowed access to Northern Rakhine State. You know, they've even talked about UN peacekeepers, which I think is unrealistic. But the, the, the fact is that uh, even humanitarians uh, or people like uh, monitors from the UN Refugee Agency are not able to get into the areas where uh, Myanmar is proposing to send these Rohingya. Uh, without international access and some sort of uh, protective mandate for uh, international staff to be able to go in these areas and monitor what happens, I think it's going to be very difficult for the government of Myanmar to persuade the Rohingya to go back. Right. And uh, I'll give the last word to you, Aman. Um Having listened to all of this, uh, do yeah. you think you will ever, ever be able to go back home? You've been outside of your country for more than 20 years. Will you ever be able to go home? At the moment, in Burma, the powerful is the army ship. She can do and undo or redo anything, anytime, in any means. The governments have nothing to do. So the NLD government is only uh, like Toothless Tiger with Robert Stem Parliament. If the any any anyone commits the army, pressurize the army, then something can change. So at present, I don't think we can go back to our home unless and unless the international community give us the security and as, as our safe area. And they, they play their role of uh, international community to protect, like us who are not protected in our own country. Right. We lost our security umbrella in our country. So we need international community to protect us. All right, okay. If the international community did not protect us, there. Right. I'm afraid uh, we have we to have, leave it there, we have Aman. No way to go there. I'm afraid we have to leave it there, Aman. Thank you so much yeah, indeed. You. Aman Ula talking to us live uh, from uh, Dhaka in Bangladesh. Thank you very much. A Rohingya 
who's been out of his country for more than 20 years, Phil Robertson, talking to us from the Myanmar capital, Naypyidaw. Thank you very much indeed, Phil's from Human Rights Watch. And Ronan Lee of Queen Mary University in London. Thank you all very much indeed for a, an interesting uh, conversation today. Thank you for watching the programme as ever. If you want to see it again, you can go to our website, aljazeera.com. If you'd like more discussion, remember there's our Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And there's the Twitter sphere. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. I'm at Martine Dennis. So from me and the whole team here in Doha, it's bye for now. <laughs> <laughs>